So we're going to move on with the next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Luis uh, Caruana. He's a Jesuit priest. He holds a degree in science, philosophy, and theology. He obtained his doctorate at the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of Cambridge. Currently, he's the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy of the Gregorian University in Rome. It's certainly the most important Catholic university we have. There is Professor of Philosophy. He was previously also teaching uh, over a couple of years, over several years, at the college, uh, the Heathrop College at the University of London. His research publications focus very much on the integration between philosophy of science, metaphysics, and philosophy of religion. And he is going to talk about different religions, different ethics. The floor is yours. Please, Louis. I would like to, first of all, to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor for me to be able to share with you some of my reflections. You are a group that represents uh, an astonishing expertise in various areas, and I hope my reflections will be helpful in a general sense. The title of my presentation, slightly different from what you have on the program, is Different Religions, Different Animal Ethics? Question mark. Interest in animal ethics has recently increased considerably. This is due to factors like technological progress, the sharp rise in human population, and the consequent pressure on global ecology. In this area, do traditional religions have anything to offer? I am convinced that religion still plays an important role in many areas of individual and communal life, for better or for worse. As regards animals, religious traditions affect the subliminal conscience and moral dispositions of billions of people. In this presentation, I will explore this effect in three sections. The first section will be about religion, the second about conceptual clarification, and the third about morality. Before I proceed, however, I need to highlight an important general point. My title, Different Religions, Different Ethics, may give the impression that I will be defending some for, form of relativism, but this is not my aim. Accepting a plurality of perspectives does not oblige us to embrace relativism. Of course, within the global complex cultural landscape, I as an individual see things from my own specific location. I will do my best to offer objective and true descriptions of what the various religions have to offer. But I cannot ignore the fact that I speak as someone who is situated at one particular spot, situated in my case within the Christian Catholic tradition. Being situated, however, does not block us from objective truth. We can still arrive at some objective truths just as we can arrive at some truths about this lecture hall, even though we are all seated at different places. First section, religion and animals. My overview here will of course be selective. I will consider the main religions that emerged from India and spread across East Asia, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. And then deal with the Abrahamic Abrahamic religions, those that consider Abraham as their founder. Hindu traditions. In Hinduism, the majority view as regards animals highlights two basic ideas. The idea of a hierarchy of living things with humans enjoying the highest status and the idea of reincarnation. The position of each animal within the hierarchy of life is not random. 
but determined by the fixed law of karma. Good deeds contribute to the believer's promotion within the hierarchy. Bad deeds to a demotion. The idea of a hierarchy determines a kind of sacred inequality differentiating all biological species, differentiating even the various ethnic groups within humanity. This idea functions well within Hinduism for promoting good behavior, but it assumes that animals are situated at a significantly inferior level when compared to the lowest caste of humans. This devaluation of animals is counterbalanced by the many sacred texts where we find praise towards anyone who shows, who shows sensitivity towards animals. It is counterbalanced by the belief that Hindu deities reincarnate as animals, especially as monkeys and cows, for instance, Rama and Krishna. According to the scholar Nandita Krishna, the cow veneration arose during the Vedic era. The cow occupies a special place in Hinduism, as you know. In giving us milk, it represents our source, our mother, or Mother Earth. A, recently, a relatively recent text confirms ahimsa, or non-violence, towards all beings, not just towards humans. We move now to the Buddhist traditions. According to most interpretations, the goal of Buddhism is to overcome suffering and free oneself from the cycle of death and rebirth. We notice, therefore, that Buddhism retains from Hinduism the hierarchical view of beings and also the idea of reincarnation. It adds, however, the idea of personal liberation through enlightenment. The main goal for humanity is to find the right spiritual practice to end the suffering that results from rebirth. Later Buddhist interpretations hold that the painful cycle of rebirth occurs in six realms of existence, the heavenly realm, the demigod realm, the human realm, the animal realm, the hungry ghost realm, and the hellish realm. The last three of these are evil realms, the animal realm included. Does Buddhism admit of a creator? This is a disputed question even today. One school holds that all phenomena originate from other phenomena and that the, cy the cycle of originating dependence is closed within itself. The universe, therefore, does not need a first cause. Other forms of Buddhism, however, admit the ultimate reality as the source of all things. As regards the status of animals, Buddhism shows trends that apparently pull in different directions. On the one hand, one maxim of the noble eightfold path is that all Buddhists should refrain from killing. On a broad interpretation, this maxim includes all sentient life. Consequently, vegetarianism is a highly respected ideal. On the other hand, Buddhism retains not only the hierarchy of life, but also the idea that the animal realm is on the evil side, in the sense that it is a realm that humans should avoid by living virtuous lives. Jain traditions. Jainism is another ancient Indian religion. It is founded on the four main ideas of non-violence, many-sidedness, non-attachment, and asceticism. Jain lifestyle is marked by vegetarianism and the avoidance of all harm to humans and animals. It is the strictest religion as regards avoiding harm to animals. All living things are meant to help one another. Killing is not allowed, not even in self-defense. Going further than Hinduism and Buddhism, Jainism considers nonviolence the highest moral duty. 
The background cosmology is similar to what we saw in Hinduism and Buddhism, namely a hierarchy of living things and the cycle of rebirth, from which humans need to be liberated. According to some Jain traditions, killing is to be avoided not because of the inherent value of living things, but to keep one's soul pure, ensuring thus a better rebirth. One important prayer includes a plea for forgiveness from all living things. The idea of jiva corresponds somewhat to what Western thinkers call consciousness or soul. But in Jainism, jiva is seen as present everywhere, in gods, in humans, in animals, in plants, in hell beings, and even in inert matter. There is therefore an emphasis on a common hidden vital principle that joins all things into a kind of brotherhood. The universe in all its realms is eternal and self-sufficient. There is no creator God who rewards and punishes. Instead, there is the law of karma. This plays the role of delivering reward and delivering punishment, and it does it through necessity. We move on now to Jewish traditions. In the Jewish Bible, we find that God created all things and that all creatures are good in themselves. We find also some specific moral obligations towards animals. For instance, the injunction not to muzzle an ox while it is working and to help a fallen overloaded donkey even if it belongs to your enemy. The prophet Kohelet, speaking about the prospects after death, holds that, quote, man has no superiority over beast. More noteworthy still, we find passages where the author describes animals as part of the human community. God commissions Noah to save not only his family, but all creatures in view of a new world order. Moreover, after the flood, God establishes the new covenant with all creatures. I have a quote there from the book of Genesis. I am establishing my covenant with you, Noah, and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. In the book of Jonah, the king's call to fast, repent, and to return to living well, in line with God's will, includes domestic animals. The kosher slaughter of animals is allowed, but it involves minimizing pain and draining away the blood to show respect towards the animal's soul. We have no time here to discuss the related issue of animal sacrifice, but we need to mention at least one other somewhat disputed point. In the book of Genesis, we find an explicit reference to human authority and supremacy. I quote here, then God said, let them humans, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. End of quote. According to many Jewish commentators, the idea here is that since God is merciful towards all creation, humans should do likewise. They should imitate God by ex extending God's mercy towards all creatures. Christian traditions. Christianity retained nearly all the religiosity of Judaism, articulated it to some extent in terms of Greek philosophy, and added its own original elements. As regards animals, the New Testament makes few direct references. Jesus did say of the birds that not one of them is forgotten before God. That's a quote. But the main thrust of the message of Jesus concerned humans. 
According to the Christian doctrine of the incarnation, Jesus is both divine and human, and he invites humans to follow him and to become children of God. This idea entails a strong form of anthropocentrism. Nevertheless, it includes also a cosmological aspect. As explained by St. Paul, Christ's salvific act embraces not just humans, but all creation, including animals. St. Paul writes, I have a quote here, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit." End of quote. Humans are definitely more important than animals. Nevertheless, many prominent Christian figures in history, like St. Francis of Assisi, became famous for their inclusion of animals as close friends, deserving love and mercy. For Catholics, official doctrinal statements focus not so much on whether animals have rights per se, but on the moral constraints that apply to humans in their treatment of animals. The current position defends not only the unquestionable dignity of the human person, but also the reality of moral obligations towards animals. On the one hand, the Second Vatican Council documents affirm that the human person is, as I quote, the only creature on earth that God has willed for, for its own sake. And the Catechism adds that animals are by nature, this is a quote, by nature, destined for the common good of past, present, and future humanity. On the other hand, the same catechism affirms that we are obliged to respect, quote, to respect the particular goodness of every creature. The recent papal encyclical Laudato Si is even more explicit. Pope Francis writes, quote, the ultimate purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us, Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us, through us, towards a common point of arrival, which is God. Moreover, another quote, our insistence that each human being is a, an image of God should not make us overlook the fact that each creature has its own purpose. None is superfluous. The overall current position emphasizes the urgent need for reconciliation with all creatures. Islamic traditions. Just like Judaism and Christianity, Islam recognizes God as creator of a, of a hierarchy of beings with humans on top. Humans enjoy a special status because they have a far higher dignity than animals. For Muslims, God created animals for the use of humans. For instance, in the Quran, I quote, and the grazing livestock he has created for you. In them is warmth and numerous benefits, and from them you eat. Another quote from the Quran, it is Allah who made for you the grazing animals upon which you ride, and some of them you eat. Humans, however, are God's vice regents on earth and are obliged to make decisions for the benefit of creation as a whole. Within Islam, therefore, we find the same kind of anthropocentrism as in many other, as in the other Abrahamic religions. Nevertheless, we need to see animals as creatures that enjoy their own communities. Animals praise God in their own way which we do not understand. For instance, in Surah 6, verse 38, we see that there is no creature or, or within the earth or bird that flies with its wings, except that they are communities like you." End of quote. 
Later holy writings support these foundation ideas in the Quran. Most significantly, the important Islamic collection, the Hadith, often described the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad's special concern for animals. The central Islamic message of love, compassion, humility, submission, and almsgiving, zakat, is applicable not only for humans, but also in the broader context of human-animal relations. The overall picture, therefore, has two sides. On the one hand, since humans are the centerpiece of creation, the killing of animals is permissible. On the other hand, maltreatment of animals is recognized as wrong. Killing for food, therefore, needs to be minimal and regulated carefully to minimize the painfulness of the procedure. The Quran, in fact, allows the eating of certain animals only and only when slaughtered in a specific way. The second part of my talk, conceptual clarification. Each religion corresponds, or better, responds, to the restlessness of the human heart by offering a particular viewpoint. Because of the various ramifications of religious traditions in the course of history, the overall stand as regards animals, animals is not always clear. Nevertheless, we can still identify at least two areas of global convergence. One area dealing with the interdependence between all living things, and the other area with the significance of the triad, conceptual triad, animality, humanity, divinity. First then, the interdependence of all creatures. All creatures, material and spiritual. The very use of the word creatures reflect, reflects a common kinship. The universe, charged with its own dynamism, shows how most creatures flourish by using other creatures. Religions see, therefore, the entire biosphere as a unified dynamic whole. This universal creaturely kinship is not a flat or a chaotic landscape. It is a hierarchy. All living things occupy a specific position within this hierarchy. Humans, as we know, may be the highest within the material realm, but they are certainly not the highest overall. Our position bestows on us not only power and authority, but also special responsibilities. The major religions accept that a lack of human respect towards animals often corresponds or often generates a corresponding lack of human respect towards other humans, especially towards the poor, the underprivileged, the physically or mentally challenged, the sick and the old. A second area of convergence involves the relation between the concepts of animality, humanity, and divinity. Religions go beyond the direct interest of animal ethicists, who normally focus on the animality-humanity relations. Religions add another dimension. As regards animality, we notice first that it is not our construct. Animality is a given. Although we can care for animals, manage animals, dominate them, and eat them, we cannot construct them ourselves. Sometimes we do use the expression animal production, but this is misleading. What we produce are things like tables and chairs. They are artifacts. Had humans never existed, the world would be bereft of tables and chairs. Not so as regards animals. They constitute part of the fundamental givenness of the world. Moreover, animality comes across to us as a realm of innocence. It is a, a morality-free zone, if you like. Sometimes we might feel nostalgic about this zone. We might yearn for this state of life. We do share in animality ourselves, but we are burdened, one might say, by another realm, the realm of thought, the realm of morality. Animality acts like a mirror that reveals something of our own nature to us. 
the gap is highly instructive. It is certainly different from the gap between machinery and humanity. When we insert animals within complex input-output structures designed for our benefit, we overlook the specific integrity that each animal represents. Factory farming degrades animality by confining it within the rigidity of machinery, within the restrictions of artificiality. Current empirical studies has, have confirmed that many animals have rudimentary forms of beliefs, of desires, and self-awareness. Nevertheless, current levels of cruelty to animals is high. For some people, awareness of such cruelty is like a personal wound, a wound that cannot heal. These people carry it with them, hidden in their hearts, wherever they go, like a kind of original sin. As regards divinity, we need to acknowledge that some religions, for instance Buddhism, apparently do not refer to God at all. Nevertheless, we can take divinity in a broad sense, as a common element for all religions. Divinity in a broad sense refers to a transcendent order to which people aspire. The transcendent order is the ultimate goal and source of moral insight. How does divinity, understood in this way, affect the animality-humanity conceptual relation? The divinity dimension opens up the horizon of religious believers to ideas about a common source and a common goal to all life. This horizon introduces a common ultimate relation of order and interdependence. Religious people feel obliged to care for animals, remaining nevertheless fully aware of their own human specificity of superior intellect and power. Are we ashamed of being so different from animals, so superior to them? The givenness of all life forms includes the givenness of our own specificity. It includes our responsibility and the alarming ecological imperative that we are discovering nowadays, namely to care not just for ourselves, but for all living things. This is a divine imperative, a commandment. My final part, moral implications. How does religion affect the foundational source of people's action? Some personal traits or habits attributes of the person as a whole are crucial for that person's moral good life. We call these traits virtues. Most religions and philosophical traditions agree that the basic virtues are not culturally dependent. Virtues like prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude are universally indispensable for genuine human flourishing. How are these virtues applicable as regards animals? Let us consider them one at a time. In general, prudence makes us identify real needs and judge well as regards the best means to adopt. Prudence ensures that we make judgments in the light of all the available data. As regards animal welfare, this means that religious believers are motivated to collect all available data, including embarrassing data like appalling farming conditions and cruel slaughtering methods. Second virtue, temperance. Temperance, as sustained by religious discipline, helps believers avoid inordinate and immoderate desires. For instance, excessive meat consumption. Justice. Justice motivates religious believers to give to each his or her due and to extend this imperative to all creatures. And finally, fortitude. Fortitude sustained by religion. This virtue makes believers act fearlessly, even when opposed. With fortitude, 
they respond effectively to ecological concerns and are ready to revise well-entrenched practices. They are ready to engage in self-corrective procedures, even as regards their own belief systems, and to learn from past mistakes. Conclusion. My arguments, although very selective, as you see, I think they add support to two main conclusive points. First, a point about human superiority. Overall, the major religions indicate that it is indeed possible to affirm two apparently conflicting claims. On the one hand, that humans have a higher dignity than all creatures. And on the other hand, that humans should not cause suffering to creatures. The way to hold these two affirmations together is to see human superiority in terms of caring for creation. Even though humans count more than animals, animals count as well. Indeed, animals should count much more than what we have been assuming for centuries. Secondly, a point about urgency. One way of re reacting to cruelty is to say that animals must wait. First, we need to learn how to eradicate cruelty to humans. And then, once this is accomplished, we will sort out our relations with animals. This kind of response, however, is very deceptive. We need to address all moral fronts together in the right way. Practices like factory farming, irresponsible genetic manip manipulation, excessive meat consumption, the use of animals for experiments, cosmetics, or entertainment should all be thoroughly revised accordingly. Animal care is an obligation, both moral and religious. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk and overview. We have time for one or two questions. Please take the mic. Thank you. You stated in the beginning of your lecture that um, different religions or you ask the questions, do different religions have uh, different ethics? H how would you answer that question now? Thank you for the question. It's, uh, of course, a very broad question. Ethics, as you know, is a, is a broad subject in philosophy. And we were just considering animal ethics, or ethics as, reg as regards questions uh, dealing with animal care and uh, animal relationships. Now, so. Uh, and religion is a concept which is quite broad, as you see. I've only selected the major religions in chronological order, as you see. Um, my aim in this very short presentation was, in fact, to concentrate not, not on issues that divide the doctrines of these religions, because there are issues that are different. But I concentrated, or I tried to extract at least two main points on which they converge. There is overlap which, in a sense, is like uh, confirming these aspects as being fundamental cognitive and moral dispositions for billions of people. And the two points, as you've seen in my, in my uh, conclusion, were the interdependence between our creatures in a kind of hierarchy and also the importance of caring for creatures. To say more than that, of course, we have to analyze each religion in more detail, and then we will, of course, extract differences. You said animal care is an obligation. Who sets the level of animal care? Who is given the definition of what is needed and what is not needed? I mean, as my predecessor, Barth, very well explained, um, this is uh, question for discernment. Discernment is a, a, a preferred word by Pope Francis. That means we need ongoing thinking and decision and reflection using all the experience available and all the principles that have served us well in our previous experience and so on. We have to have a step-by-step -step reflection on what we're doing. So, 
people who have hands-on experience, like scientists in this area, have a contribution to make. People who have studied uh, philosophy and theology as regards morality have also a contribution to make. And together, we will, of course, um, try to discern what care, animal care, really means. There are extremes, of course, people who may say that animal care really means not killing them, not eating them. Others would say that animal care could, in fact, um, mean nothing other than uh, having them serve us well, because that is where their dignity lies in serving us. These are two extreme positions, as you see. Um, and care is, is an ongoing question that needs to be treated with responsibility from all sides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. We have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much.